All right, guys. Um, so we're doing going through a hamstring and quad workout, mainly um, quads. Well, it was a lot of more sets hamstrings, but the main exercises were quads. So I'm going to make it mainly quads. Um, so before we get into the workout, I'm going to go through a couple of things with you uh, to get you thinking and to understanding the things happening in there. So it, because we're training legs, the topic of squats is bound to come up, and every it's almost a very popular thing to say. Squats are the king of leg exercises, which is just false. A squat is a squat. It doesn't. There are so many ways to squat. You could squat hip dominant. You could squat knee dominant, and you could squat you know, like wide stance. You could squat narrow stance. There are so many different ways to squat that to say the squat is all automatically the best leg builder or the king of leg exercise is false. And a lot of people will say, okay, we've got weak legs. It's time to train legs more frequently, which is another topic I'll get into, but. Um, in another video, but for now, they say, you know, you've got to squat. It's just not right. Like, if you're squatting incorrectly for quads in the first place, or whatever it happens to be, part of your leg, whatever you want to be training, then it doesn't, it, it's pointless, because unless you're actually squatting for quads, you're not going to grow your quads. Like, squats, uh, they could, you could be, if you're hip dominant, most likely you're training more glutes. And if you're going knee dominant, most likely you're going to be training, um, more quads. Now, another thing with squats is the golden rule of um, ass to grass, where if it does not ass to grass, it doesn't count as a rep. Which again, most of you who follow me already know, it just is ridiculous to say that. Because if you're squatting, say for a knee dominant, for example, you're you're gonna have, you're aiming for full knee flexion, as much knee flexion as you can get there to load the quads in your length of position, because you're taking the, your knees as far away from the, um, the, the, the line of pull of the bar, so the horizontal bar, the bar is here, if your knee, if this is your knee, my left hand is my knee, this is the bar, if my knees are here, it's right under the bar, so my center of mass is right under that bar, it's, there's not much load there, but as my knee gets further and further away, the amount of torque at that knee is going to increase, so you're doing more work on the quads, now if I went the other way, and I break it my hips first, my ass is going back first. So guess what? My ass is going to be the thing, my, my, my glutes are going to be what's most loaded compared to my knees because now my knees are going to be directly under. Think about it. If this is my hip going back, my knees are going to be seen directly under the bar. See how it's no longer a quad dominant exercise? Because the thing that most loaded is your ass. That's why you get a lot of people who go, hey man, I've got a big ass, a big glute pump, but I don't have a pump in my legs. And that's why. Now, another thing is, to ask the grass, if you go into full knee flexion, a fully flexed knee is hamstrings touching your calves. So that doesn't mean that your ass is going to touch you know, your heels. It's, it's, for some people, that's not possible. Imagine if you're Kai Green, and you're really big, or you've got really mass, massive hamstrings and really massive calves. Guess what? And they're going to hit sooner, right? And you can't just jam them on top of each other. They're not going to flatten each other out. Like, if your hamstrings and calves are this thick, your range, you're going to get stuck here. If they're, if they're, you know, you're softer. Um, hamstrings and softer, the smaller calves and hamstrings, and you're gonna get a little bit more range. Most you, you can, you know, potentially you can do it. So, and the other thing to think about is, can you actually go there? But like anybody can do ass to grass. Really, really, in re the real, realistically, anybody can do it. Load the bar up with enough weight, and the weight will just shove you straight into there. You know, you're not going there actively. You're not working. You might be coming down actively for the for like four inches, and then. You, because you're not actually, actually able to go down any further actively, the weight will just shove you straight down in there. So, sorry, to get into that bottom position, you have to be asking yourself, so how far should I how squat, you know, how low should I squat, how deep should I go? The answer is, you have to ask yourself a couple of questions. First of all, what is the range you can go through actively or passively? You know, can your tissues tolerate that in that position? Can you actually tolerate that? Because your brain will automatically go, fuck, I, I've got to tighten up, I can't go there if, if your tissues cannot tolerate it because your brain is trying to keep you um, away from injury. So when we squat, I'll go into the, when we go through the video, I'll explain the way I'm squatting for you, I'll break it down for you. But that's what you need to be aware of. Don't think about ass to grass. Think about muscles, think about joints. Because at the end of the day, there's a lot happening. 
in a, uh, between a, a bar, you, you know, your legs, if you think about it, your, your toes, your ankles, your knees, your hips, are, why all of a sudden is it just simplified to ask the grass? And there's a lot of things in between those things that you should be thinking about. And I'll piggyback off of that. When I mean, you're trying to progress on the squat, there are so many things you could do to improve your squat that trying to progressively overload by chucking more weight on or grow your legs by progressively overloading um, by just increasing the weight is just not an optimal way to go and you're swimming up your head plateaus because you get you have these weak links and you end up having to go back relearn things you, if you don't at some point you're gonna have to do that because at some point your form's gonna start breaking down you want to go back revise and improve things again but if you keep doing that you're gonna plateau really quickly so instead of that there, think about as I just said all this all these things happening try to work on improving one thing at a time so for example when you see a bit later in the video when I'm squatting the first two reps of my top set my nut sack set um, the first two reps were nice they were controlled by the third rep what happened my neck went forward and that pulled my weight forward I started falling forward and I had a reset in between reps it just wasn't very good so the next time I squat I don't need to be more weight to put more weight in the bar to progressive overlay. All I need to do is fix up the fact that I'm falling forward. So how do I do that? I can tuck my chin in and control my neck posture a lot better. All of a sudden, I'm now more upright. I'm not leaning forward and my glutes aren't working as much. My quads have automatically been, I'm now automatically doing more work. So they're being overloaded because I am increasing the amount of work done in the muscle tissue. Now, do you have to squat? No, it's just, there's no such thing, well, okay, I could probably make a case for some exercises that will protect your joints and protect muscle integrity and all that kind of stuff, um, but otherwise, there's just no such thing as a necessary exercise. There are plenty of like even elite bodybuilders, pro bodybuilders that have awesome legs and they don't squat, at least not a barbell squat. I for one have not barbell back squat with a... You know, not, not the safety bar, that, that, that's a back squat too if you want to call it that. But I have not done the, the squat like with a bar like that in over nearly two years now. I've been either front squatting or using a safety bar. Because uh, I can't squat like this. Number one, I don't like getting back here because it's very hard on my shoulders. Um, there are ways to do it if you, I want to do it, but I just don't feel the need to do that. And when I squat like that, I because of the nature of it here, my body leans forward automatically as soon as I do that. So what happens is I tend to break at the hips first, meaning I get a freaking you know big glute pump as opposed to um, uh, a quad st stimulation there. And if you've seen any of my videos, you can see that my ass grows. My ass is relatively big and it grows very fast in my experience. Um, so no, like if you've got really long femurs, people with really long femurs and a shorter tibia. I kind of have a lot of, a, uh, you know, the, the tibialis, the T TA, uh, your lower shin bone. It's, they find it really hard to squat. They're, they're not optimal squatters. So are there people genetically born to squat? Yeah. Like if you've got a shorter femur, you can probably, you, with a, you know, or even an equal, you know, TA and your femur are um, relatively in the same ratio. Chances are you're built to be a good squatter. Imagine people with really long torsos too. Things change. So... All of a sudden, the squat might not be for them, but they might be able to do something like a hack squat. So the barbell back squat is by no means an absolute necessary exercise, um, you know, to include as your part of your leg workout. So that's um, squats out of the way. Um, I want to talk a bit, a bit about hamstrings now. So in most cases, if you don't have a problem, you, know, you can train hamstrings. You know, it doesn't really matter too much. There's a number of ways you can program things. But because I have an issue, um, I worked with Coach Eugene, we kind of identified problems that stem from all the way down to my feet and they kind of come up to my hip as well. Basically, when you're walking, what you want is your femur to be rotating out and your TA to be rotating in. I'm not actually, that's not happening for me. What's happening is my TA is rotating externally as well. So what happens is, my, it's not unable to do it, there's no range there and it's extremely weak. So what happens is my femur actually rotates even further to compensate for that. Um, so when that transfers over to my hamstring training, what happens is it's when I'm like performing the lying leg curls, even um, seated leg curls, 
Whenever I try to perform knee flexion with the emphasis on hamstrings, what happens is this. My left femur starts to rotate outwards like this. It's not such a big deal if it's just a little bit, but because, you know, as you shorten your hamstrings, fully shorten them, it's going to happen to some degree because your glutes are going to have to work. But for me, it happens excessively. And so I lose tension on my hamstrings a lot. So one of the things I'm doing at the moment is starting off workouts with seated leg curls and then going on to uh, lying leg curls with my toes pointing. In, in normal cases, I would say, don't point your toes, but actually like, you know, contract your tibia because the gas drop on muscle on your calf actually crosses over the knee joint. If you point your toes, you're contracting your gas drop as well, so it's working on top of your hamstrings. You got your calves working. If you don't, you know, so just point your toes on a hamstring curl and do it. You find that your calves are working as well. That's why you would want to, um, you know, you, you lengthen out the calves by contracting your TA. It just basically, because now it can't contract and your hamstrings still do the load. But in my case, I'm trying to get everything to work together uh, because it's dysfunct I'm dysfunctional at the moment around there. So the reason that I'm starting with a seated leg curl as opposed to a lying leg curl where you can fully um, shorten your hamstrings, and in most cases for innovation purposes, I would get somebody to do a um, lying leg curl because you can fully shorten them, unlike a, uh, the hamstrings that is, unlike a seated leg curl. However, on a lying leg curl, you're, you only have something to shove your thighs into. There's nothing to hold you, to lock your hips in place. So for most people with extremely weak hamstrings as well, like me, I'm a shit hamstring. Um, what happens is, as you're shortening the hamstrings, the the hips start lifting up to make the movement easier. All right, so you're carrying less, you're not hip extending at the hip anymore, it's lengthening at the hip, the hamstrings, where you're only flexing at the knee. Uh, so instead of doing that, I'm starting on the line and the seated leg curls because I've actually got um, the side pad just as I do with the lying leg curl, but then I also have the backrest, so I'm stabilizing there in my, in my pelvis. And that allows me to just focus on um, fully shortening the hamstring there and knee flexion. But key thing, I know, as I just said before with the squats, a fully you know, flex knee, so a fully shorten, uh, it's a fully, you achieve full knee flexion, that's hamstrings to calves. The question, and with a squat, that's one thing. Now with a hamstring, it's another thing because how can you, you have to ask yourself the question, can you perform full knee flexion while maintaining tension in the hamstrings? For some people, they can't even do that. I'm not even too good at it either. You know, there's a good reason I have shit hamstrings. So that's what I'm trying to work on now, just to work on the seated leg curl and just try to get full knee flexion there as, while maintaining tension um, on the, the hamstrings. All right, um, last thing before we jump into it is uh, because a lot of people want to talk about this kind of stuff where it's uh, toes in, toes out um, to work different parts of the the quads. You know what? Like, especially this is a prominent on the leg extensions as well. It's a terrible idea. Think about this: the leg extension travels up and down. Yeah, it's the, the it's a fixed plane of force. It's like a hinging. Your knee joint is also a hinge. Now, if you start turning, so if this was my. I can't do this. If this was here, was my hips. This was my knees and my toes here. All right. The leg extension pushes force down this way, and I would go up this way. If I turn my toes, what's changed other than my toes turning? Right, I could turn them to toes in, toes out, but guess what? None of your quads or your heads are attached to your toes. They're attached to your femur and hips. I mean, not your femur, it's your knee and your hips. That, that's where it is. It's at the femur, and it's, it doesn't come all the way down to your toes. So, toes in, toes out to hit different parts of the heads is bullshit. Um, Especially if you're rotating your hips and knees and shit out of the, you know, so that you're kind of going off at an angle while the force is going here, as with bicep curls and things like that. Because the elbow, like the knee, is a hinge joint. So yes, I don't do that. If you want to make a case for biasing um, different heads and the quads, I would say it's got more to do with range of motion. Like, if you want to hit that, you know, that teardrop muscle, that most people call it, then you're going to get that most likely in the full knee flexion. If you do it yourself, completely flex your knee, you'll find the most tension is right there in that team drop muscle. Um, that's because it, it attaches around the knee and it doesn't attach to the hip. 
Uh, now, with your rec fem, for example, which is right up there near your hip, your hip flexor, it attaches to the hip. That's why in my latest extension, you see me sitting upright because I'm shortening it from the hip. Sorry. So shortening from the hip by sitting a bit more upright there. Um, how much do you sit upright? Well, that's from person to person again. Um, and then the out of the sweep of the quad, and again, is you will hit it to some degree um, when you go into full knee flexion, but it's usually that heart, what people call that half rep range, that um, you're going to be hitting most of it. Because if you go into full knee flexion, as I was saying, you're going to start engaging that tear drop muscle. Uh, so the medialis, you're going to start engaging that. And so that could potentially, I don't know, like, this is, don't take my word for this, but it could potentially take the tension, uh, do more work, take over the work from the, um, the sweep. So, yeah, you can make a case, if you watch on the hack squats, um, I stop once I run out of uh, range of motion at the knee, which is, I should probably elaborate on that for you. Um, a lot of people will call it, what, when you watch it, it'll be like a half rep. But if you want to watch it carefully, when you watch the range of motion at my knee and the hip, uh, all right. So it. we're gonna dive into it now. Uh, we're starting off with uh, hamstrings, as I said. Um, well, before we get into it, though, I'm gonna preface it by saying that all the things I tell you from the execution, the, the, the little cues I give you, are all gonna be meaningless if you train like a pussy. Like, pick your nuts up and train hard when you say train hard it means in a lot of aspect it means mentally but it also means physically and mostly mentally though because when you're training in the, the the set gets harder people start speeding up the reps to hit the goal reps or they they, they start you know losing control over everything else to letting things swing in the name of getting more reps and extending the set but it's actually a lot harder to keep things within strict parameters as you fatigue. Whereas you get tired and you fatigue and then you start getting loose, that's easy. It's hard to maintain that. Like if you're trying to keep your feet planted, keep your glutes contracted, um, keep your core locked down, keep your thoracic spine up, keep your you know your neck in alignment and extended. Keep See, that's a long list of things you have to be paying attention to even as you get tired whereas if you loosen up any of those then that's one thing less that you have to be taking care of so in actuality that's making it easier despite you thinking that you're making it harder and the other thing is you have to understand there's, there are different ways of failure like eccentric failure concentric failure and form failure you need to apply them um, correctly lastly you need to be spending time where the exercise has most merit and where it's tough well, a lot of people as it gets harder they just start cutting out where, it, where it, as it gets harder they might try to make it easier in order to get those reps out the number of reps you're trying to get should be secondary to the quality of your reps so if that means that you're only going to be able to get partial um a partial rep make it a partial rep because that's the range you can actually work in the mus muscles actually working if you start swinging it up there then you're using momentum so you've made it easier don't get another thing is don't get lazy on these eccentrics as you get tired as you get tired it's a tendency to get the weight up and then go that's it the reps done and just let the, the the weight swing downwards that's not what you're trying to do you always be trying to control every single inch in every single second that you're in your working set and then getting to those hard points like for a leg extension for example that's where the toughest part is at the top I can hit partials all day long at the bottom but nobody can really get to that top range in this fully shortened position over and over and over because you fatigue and it's really hard to get there and people start speeding it up they get up there and they they just want to drop it back down so it's a bit similar to concentric but not quite so as you get up there, as you see me, I'm, ex I'm spending time in that top position no matter how tired I get until I can no longer at all get there and spend time. Then I start to not spend time there and you know reduce the, the, range, of the, re the range of motion on the rep. Anyway, let's get going now. So starting off here, you're paying attention to my torso position 
and my hips. Ideally, you would have bars around here so that you can contract your lat, which and you know, pull your uh, humerus down, which is partly contracting your lat. So you stabilize your entire upper body. It's not swinging. You see that I'm not lying flat down because when you're lying flat down, what you're doing is flexing at this hip area. Now when I'm, I'm propping my body upright, I'm extended at the hip. The hamstrings attach at the hip. They originate from the hip here and they attach at the knee, right? In other words, to fully shorten your hamstring, what you need to do is bring these two ends together. If you're in hip flexion where you're lying down, then you're you're lengthening the, the hamstrings at this hip area and it, all you're really getting is knee flexion. Now, despite being hip extension, in hip extension here, what you still need to be thinking about is keeping your hips down on that pad. Otherwise, if you're not conscious of that, your hips are going to come up, want to come up naturally because it makes the movement easier. So here I'm doing a single leg so that I have um, better hip control. Because if I do it both legs, they, they, they don't work quite evenly in my legs. So it, it, it um, makes it too difficult for me to maintain my hip. Not that I don't do it at all. So we did, I did five sets of this. This is the absolute last set. Um, in normal cases, you want to have your, um, your toes flexed. So your ankle flex, sorry. So your tibia, tibia anterior is contracted. Here I've got my, I'm pointing my toes because I'm trying to coordinate my feet with my hamstrings here because I've got um, foot issues as you know. So you saw that rate was pretty bad, you know, my whole body just jerked. Right, that's a lot better there. You'll notice as well on the left leg, if we go back quickly again, that it's very chunky. See that was really nice and chunky, like, nice and terrible. It comes up alright, but it comes down really, really chunky. You see that? So all that's showing there is that I lack um, eccentric strength. So without even increasing the weight, simply getting stronger eccentrically there would be progressive overload for the hand from the left. So I'm trying to fiddle around here. I'm trying to find a position where I can really, really um, lock my body in stone and just focusing on the um, hips there. So what I'm thinking about is driving my whole entire thigh down and my hips down and forward into that pad the entire time throughout. And I'm not going to full knee extension because that, that's when the tension comes off the hamstring. I'm just finishing off here with two legs and mainly with the right leg, um, right hamstring to curl it up and lowering it mainly with the, uh, the left on the way down. So I'm taking my right uh, ankle off just ever so slightly. And you can see, I don't care about touching the pad to my ass or anything like that because whatever range you can do, because most people can't even get there. In my case, that's as far as I can possibly go while maintaining tension on the hamstring. This is a warm-up set for squats. Um, so for warm-up sets, what you're going to notice is uh, commonly, the common practice for warm-up sets is lots of reps, machine gun style reps, and just to get blood into the muscle. That's a lot different to how I would warm up and how I would suggest you warm up. Use your warm-up sets to um, not only rehearse the movement, but to have a feel, have a feel of, find your range, have a feel of um, what, is everything working? Is there anything that's not working? Um, as an example, are your hips stable? You know, if you go down to this bottom position, it's like, my hips aren't stable in that position, then you have no business loading up that bar with um, in what load, because if you can't even do it with, that, with just the bar alone, how are you going to keep your hips stable when you've got like 60, 100 kilos on there? It's just not possible. So use it as an opportunity to um, find what's working. That means everything, paying attention to everything from your neck to your jaw, your breathing, find what's not working, rehearse it, get it right before you jump into those um, top nutsack sets. So here I've got the, the wedge under my feet um, because I don't have the best ankle mobility and uh, just to help me fully lengthen the quads. If I was flat on the ground, I can't really do it. So with this um, wedge, it's a lot better than using, you know, plates and everything because you can, uh, you know, determine how far up you need to go. Um, there's a way to determine how far you shift your heel up as well. So this is my third warm-up set. You'll notice that I go through the reps really slowly because, again, 
I'm trying to pay attention to all the details, every single little thing that I'm doing and rehearsing the movement, finding my depth, all that kind of stuff. Um, trying to get stable, see if there's anything that needs to be worked on. So that's what you need to be doing with your warm. Pay attention to those things. You can't be do, paying attention to your all these different things like your, your thoracic spine, your lower back, your core, your neck, your jaws, your knees, hips. Yeah, it's, it's just so many things that you can't be paying attention to them if you're going really, really quickly. It makes it is impossible. And this is, I'm just finding angles there. I'm right? just making sure that my angles, my thoracic spine is right, everything's there. What I'm thinking about here is, in particular is that I'm thinking about standing up. I'm not breaking at the um, hips first, as you notice. I'm breaking at the knees first because I want to load the quad the knee flexion at the bottom there. So this is a top set. What you'll notice is after the second rep, my neck goes, as in my head angle is not um, so there. A little pause there, and I don't maintain it. And you watch how my my body tends to lean forward in these reps. Just it's a slight, but it's it's happening. And what's happening there is I'm just my head's going forward. I'm not pulling my neck back and, and, and looking my and training my eyes in the right position. So it, what's causing that? What's happening is it's causing my um, body to fall forward. So I'm going to just fall earlier here. I don't want to be eccentric. Failure. I can do that on another exercise. So, um, with that uh, in mind, as you can see there, I want to go back to show you it. I am not trying to get ass to grass or anything like that. All I'm doing is bringing my hamstring to my calf and then trying to hold that position. Here I'm not holding it at all, but in the next weeks to progress, that's what I'm going to be doing. Um, so coming down and holding it for one to two seconds in that bottom position. Not just sitting there though, what I'm actually doing is contracting the quad right there in the bottom. So, what you need to be thinking about is driving. I want you to be thinking about leg pressing the ground or pushing the floor away from you. Because it, it, it has, with any movement, if you think about standing up, at the bottom it's really hard, but as you get up, it gets easier and easier and easier because of the nature of the strength profile and the resistance profile. And as it gets up, it gets easier. So your effort starts to decrease if you think about standing up. And so you, you, you're, you lose the amount of tension you're getting and you don't have the same amount of output. On the other hand, the floor is solid. It's never going to move anywhere. You can shove as hard as that as you possibly as you want, you know, and, and you can. So physics. Whatever force you exert in one direction is the exact amount of force you exert in the other. So if you exert, like, you know, I don't know, say 100 pounds of um, force down onto the floor, you get 100 pounds up. Whereas if you're going up, you can't really do that. So the, 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 what you need to be paying attention to is um, your foot position here for, in particular to do that. In other words, you want the, the weight on your um, the ball of your feet where your big toe is and you want it on the um, outside of your pinky so towards your pinky area with the ball of your feet there and on your heel if you're like me and you have uh, overly pronated foot uh, what i have found to work is if you just lift your toes just a little you won't lose balance because the you know you don't have any load on your toes anyway it's on the ball of your feet and your, your heels so those are the three points of contact that you want with the ground in terms of your feet so it's like a tripod now so the whole entire time you need to be thinking about driving um, down into the ground. The other thing you want to be doing is thinking about shoving your feet outwards, isometrically against the ground. Obviously, your feet won't slide, but what you're trying to do is create outward intent on your quads. And what you should be doing, if you're doing it right, is you should feel your entire, all your quads fire up. One of the things that's going to do is ensure that your knees do not buckle inwards as you come down or up which is a very common thing. When you're putting the, um, in the, the intent outwards like that, you're keeping your knees outwards. Again, let your knee track as it should track. And don't try to fight it, like swinging your hips and doing whatever, all that sort of crap. Let it do what it needs to do, and you focus on the rest. Um, other things you want to be paying attention to is keep, you don't 
don't ever try to look up or try to look down as I did with my head. So try to keep it neutral and then keep your eyes slightly upward a little or even straight ahead if you can, um, wherever it's natural. Because wherever, if, if you know in fighting, wherever your head goes, um, if you can control your opponent and wherever you control your, your opponent's head, that's wherever the body will go. It just works. Um, other than that, let's keep moving on. So that was the top set, the only top set I did for Now, um, common misconception is that adding bands in reverse be any further from the truth. If you're doing it right, it doesn't make it easier, it makes it fucking harder. See, at the bottom, if you load this bar, now I'm, I'm gonna just make it for easy mass. Um, you got 100 kilos on this bar, like you got 100 kilos on your back at this top position. At the top, you can handle 100 kilos. But as you squat down into the hole, um, as due to muscle lengthening and your center of mass shifting forward, so the horizontal distance from the bar to your knee being greater than when you were standing at the top, that bar no longer weighs 100 kilos. There's no longer 100 kilos exerted on you. So a 100 kilo squat is never necessarily a 100 kilo squat because as you come down, 100 kilos is no longer 100 kilos. That could be as much as 150 kilos at the bottom. As you come up, yeah, it's 100 kilos. So, what does that mean? That means if you've got 100 kilos at the top, you can handle 100 kilos at the top. There's no way you can handle it. Even you can't handle 150 at the bottom, you're going to bottom out. You can't get back up when you're down there, right? So, what happens? If you want to get be able to use 100 kilos at the uh, bottom, you're going to be reducing the weight at the top so that it's only about 60 at the top. I'm making up numbers here. So, 60 at the top would equal 100 at the bottom. You see how it's there because the resistance profile um, changes as uh, your strength profile changes there. So with the bands, what we're doing is we're matching your your output ability with the strength profile. So let's say now that you can load up at the top with a bar, um, 100 kilos, uh, right? As you get to that bottom position, it will still be 100 kilos because the bands are now pulling on it. So now you can do 100 kilos at the bottom and it's still 100 kilos at the top because the bands are no longer assisting at the top. That means you are working the entire time. There is the, 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 there's no point where you get a rest. Think about bench press, for example. Well, actually, we'll just use a squat. At the bottom, it's really hard. As you get up, you get up. And after the halfway point, you just boom and you lock out. As you get to the bottom, though, and, and this is why people do half reps because it's really hard to go to the bottom, right? But you can't. It's easy at the top. So with the bands now, that changes it. So as you come down to the bottom, the the load catches on from the bar, but the, the bands are, are pulling it up a little to reduce the load there. Now, as you come back up, the bands are no longer pulling on you, are no longer assisting, pulling on the bar, so no longer there's no pull from the resistance band, which means that the load catches on in the bar and you are carrying the entire load of the bar on your back. So now the suck factor exists from every single point, from the point you unload the bar at the top, all the way, unwrap the bar, sorry, all the way to the bottom, it still sucks, and as you get up, it sucks, 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 every single inch sucks, there are no breaks, unlike with, without the bands where you get a rest at the top, because there's no tension or anything, because it gets easier at the top there. Anyway, so this is a back down set, meaning I've just lowered the weight, um, and I'm just going for uh, more reps, and not necessarily more reps, but I'm just training in a different rep range um, to get stronger because you want to be stronger in all rep ranges not in one exclusively so that that's just that now this is the setup all i did was take the the safety racks and i put them up the top here and wrap the bands around them you can just obviously adjust like depending on your height and all that sort of stuff you could adjust where the uh, bands go of course there's heaps of ways of different uh, ways of banding it too like just folding it in half if you need to so you know, uh, several factors to um, be wary of. Um, because you don't have the safety racks at the bottom anymore, just go to form failure. Don't worry about going to negative failure here. Uh, if if you want to be on the safe side, nobody's using um, safety racks. Just pull like you can see the ones here. Just move them over here. 
just put them there so you got, you know, you're homing them a little bit there. So don't do that, and don't be a dick and do that if, if somebody else needs it. There's, enough, there's no tension from the bands here. Here, the band's starting to help out. And then I come up, see how it comes up towards the top? The bands are no longer assisting, and the whole bar is loaded on me. So, done, so you don't go and throw bands on if you don't really know what you're doing. Um, can you band from the bottom? Yes, you can. You do the same thing. The difference is, because it's pulling you down on the eccentric, you have to work a lot uh, harder on the eccentric and it's likely to cause more, uh, more muscle damage overall. And here I just want to recover as much as possible. I'm trying to stimulate, not create as much muscle damage as possible. So, um, you know, I don't want to do it from, from that. I want to do it that way. So with the first set, I did a lot more locking out, whereas this set, I'm just trying to go for you know, work and work and work. So I do lock out towards the top here and get some pauses to get some more reps, but otherwise, Go, 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 and bump. So, two sets. There you go. One ultra heavy one, anywhere between five to eight reps. And then this one was around, I can't remember, maybe 10 to 15 reps. I don't know how many I got there. Um, I think at this point you might be wondering why I'm bare feet as well. Because um, you think about ancient China back then when they had, oh, I can't remember the word right now, um, when they had females with their toes all like, you know, in those shoes and broken off and shit, um, all those kind of crazy shit they did. And when they, and later on after the end the era, and women had all their toes all curled up, that's not normal. They couldn't walk. If you're always in your shoes and things like that, your feet, your toes, those things never get to go through a full range, their full range of emotion. So they get locked in. Like if you've got all curled up toes and everything, that's not right. Think about it this way. Look at how hand your hand is nice and pliable, right? Your feet are they as pliable? Well, they're probably never going to be as pliable, but they're probably completely stiff, like like uh, you know they're nice. That's not that's not healthy feet for sure. That's why I whenever I get the opportunity, I try and barefoot, so my bare feet, so I can take my feet through the full range of motion and look, you know. It also increases proprioception. Like, if you've ever done a trained bare uh, feet before, you never want to wear shoes again. It feels amazing. Leg extensions now. Um, things to pay attention to. Number one, I, I am pulling myself down that pad really hard. Pull it up so um, it's rested on your back. So what I'm doing, sorry. What I'm doing is pulling my ass into the seat as hard as I can. If your ass is coming off, the exercises are becoming easier. You're allowing your, your quads to lengthen at the hip. The quads, most of them, some of the heads, um, the, not the teardrop or the medialis, that, that's just around the knee. The other heads do, att like your rect fem, uh, um, attach to your hip. So to load it there, you're going to need to perform um, hip flexion because if you're um, extended at the hip, it's obviously lengthened. So here what I'm doing is I'm staying upright as opposed to leaning back onto the chair, into the backrest. So keep a bit more upright. How upright? That's dependent on what you can do. So now pull yourself, um, pull, pull, your, pull on those bars so you keep your ass on the ground, on, on, the, on the seat. Don't let your ass come up no matter what. Now, other thing is don't swing. If you can adjust this bottom part here, which I can't, on this particular leg extension, move out a little bit so that you know your your um, you start with your heels, your ankles directly below your knees because uh, you know really you could do those if it was just in the more um, knee flex position, you could just stand sit there flexing all day as I was saying. The merit of the leg extension is you can load it um, in the fully short position, so that's the top part where your knee is fully extended and you are um, you you are in hip flexion as well because you are bringing the two ends of your quads at the knee and the hips closer together so it's more shortened. I don't know that there's any other uh, quad exercise that allows you to do it besides a, a, a leg extension. So um, that's the, the merit of the leg extension at the top. Take advantage of that, go up there, spend like two seconds and work for those two seconds. Don't just get there and hold it, you know. Get up there and squeeze the shit out of it. Uh, 
swing in this load here. And I'm trying really hard. I'm slipping. If, you, if your hands are going for whatever reason, you can use wraps and straps. And don't let that be a limiting factor. You see here, I don't go all the way down. So I'm just keeping that there. I don't need to emphasize that length of the like the contact wraps forever. Now what you know is I'm not flinging this weight up. I'm contracting, I'm squeezing. I get to that bottom position, and the first thing I think about for moving is squeeze my quad. Squeeze, and then squeeze, squeeze into that top position, and then spin from there. You see here. But I'm no longer able to do it, so I'm just getting up there. What you're not able to see is this load is actually hitting the top. So at the, the first couple of reps here, when I get to the top, I'm actually pressed, you know, the load is no longer going to go anywhere. So what I'm doing is contracting really, really hard, and that load will push against the, the top of the machine, right? And that's called the eyes of the trunk. You can contract as hard as you want, and the load will never go anywhere, which is why I did that. So you're really, really emphasizing the uh, short position, which you can't really do in any other exercise. So once I could no longer spend time there, I no longer hold the position. Once you can no longer get there, then I'm just going for the partial now. So again, I'm squeezing, but I'm not swinging it up. So keep your core locked in stone, keep your, your uh, chest up and go again. So I'm performing just one drop set because this is the only one set I did for the extensions. So mentally, you need to be able to go to far places there. So, don't, 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 don't quit it. A lot of people tend to quit when it starts to burn. So keep going and going and, and going as much as you can. I think that was I aimed for 10 to 15 there. So what you won't be able to see here, and I apologize for having no carbs, um, is, is that, uh, what was I saying? Anyway, what you can't see um, is that I actually have reverse bands. It's the same concept as the, uh, the squats. The only thing is, I want to load the... Um, mid-range more is I was saying I want to hit the or for lack of a better word more common commonly known as the uh, sweep the lateralysis of the quad um, uh, what you'll notice here I want you to pay attention to where I end the range of motion now keys the, the, the reason the hex squat is my go-to for the finisher here is number one because it's novel number two I can use baby weights like just 200 kilos and um, and I can get a great pump by doing machine gun reps on it too. So perfect finisher. Now, um, you've got a lot of contact points, unlike a squat where your only contact point is the floor. Here you've got this platform and you've also got um, this back pad and you've got the shoulder pads. So what you were trying to be thinking about here is driving your heels down into this pad this way, right? And you're trying to shove your feet upwards on this pad. Now here, this week I wasn't doing it yet, but the week after what I did was you pull your toes up as I did what I was saying with the squats so that I could put the load around this part of my foot here. Now, another thing is driving your back into this pad. Don't let your back come off this pad. Um, and then obviously pull the bars down to contract your, you know, the, your lats to keep stability there. Um, how far, you wanna put your feet as low as you can so that you can get a um, range of motion, you can come down to where you need to, whatever your goal. Sometimes you want to fully lengthen the quad, and you know you might have to raise your heels up. I don't do all that a lot, um, rarely ever. So um, if you have very poor range of motion, you might need to put your feet uh, you're higher up on the platform. Obviously, this is adjustable too. Um, this is just what I was feeling all right for me, and my heels came off just a tiny little bit. So that, that, that was an easy fix because all I needed to do was lift my toe in and that that fix it so I didn't have to shift, shift my feet anyway I was going for 10 to I think around 10 reps here maybe 12 I know I know the goal was 10 for 15 reps right? so you see how that's it now see how that came from my hips right that means my, my quads have already done all the work and they couldn't do any more work there's no more range left of me it's just my hips working so I Cut it off a little bit sooner than the first rep. Yeah, you can see how that there's no more. My, I run out of range of motion for me here. See how that's now. If I go any deeper, it's just coming from my hips, and I don't want that because I'm trying to load it in the, in the knee. Right, so I'm not trying to load my ass. That's the same idea with the squat that you couldn't see from the side. 
So, yeah, yeah, hamstrings onto those calves and then boom, go. You notice how also I also trap my, my um, sternum angle the same. So, no, I said no. Couldn't even come up anymore. That's negative failure. That's what we call negative failure. So, the last exercise, I'm just pushing it. To one set, again. I shift my feet up to cut the range of motion a little. And you'll notice in the first few dog games that I don't lock out I mean, until that in there to just to get it up. So here we go. It's not fully locked out on me. I want you to go non-stop, don't stop, that's it. Could not get another rep for the life of me there. And I'm fucked, I just needed to stay there for a while. So then I lift my legs out of it after. But so that's the entire workout. Two sets of squats. The first one around five to eight. Um, try to go for a tempo, tempo about 4010 to start and then try to improve that to 4110 and then 4210. And then the, um, the leg extensions, I'm emphasizing the top for about two seconds. Once I can't do that, it's about one second. Once I can't do it for one second, then it's just get up to that position, get into that fully short position and go, and then keep going until I'm hitting partials there. Um, you can do the drop if you want. If you don't have to, if you don't want to, you don't have to. Um, just depends how much you're getting out of that set. If you can do it without it, great. Um, but that was one set, and then hack squats, reverse band hack squats here. Um, just one total all-out set as your finisher for a nice pump uh, with some pink dumbbells, and uh, that, that's uh, that, that's the entire workout. Um, uh, then, then after that, just wobble the fuck out of the gym.